Now, this little guy back here, that's the cerebellum. The cerebellum sits rather chastely <laughs> beneath the hemispheres on top of the brain stem. And the beautiful thing about the cerebellum is we know its structure minutely. There's just one problem. <laughs> We, we don't, don't understand it how it works. Yeah, I can tell you this, and this is a generalization, but I think it'll work. The cerebral cortex has great ideas about what it wants the body to do. It sends those commands down through the brainstem to the spinal cord to produce changes in what we call motor neurons, and it is these that drive the musculature, exactly. Now, there's only one problem. The central nervous system is a very dirty organism, not well behaved, highly democratic in its principles. So that what the cortex wants and what the cortex gets down, downstairs, very seldom the same thing. However, samples of everything the cortex wants and sends down are also send, sent to this little fellow, the cerebellum. The cerebellum also is getting simultaneously information about what's really happening downstairs. And so it's the cerebellum that knows how far the downstairs folks are deviating from what the upstairs folks want. The cerebellum makes a comparison of the two, sends back the difference to the cortex, the cortex gulps hard, and sends <laughs> down new information. In that way, as we make a golf swing, even in the process of the swing, we are modulating on the basis of how far the actual swing deviates from the model that we programmed, and, and the cerebellum is involved. Now, originally, the thought was all the cerebellum did was sort of coordination work, but it, yeah. I think recently yeah. people are now very seeing much very so. much more sophisticated uh, very, actions are in the cerebellum. Very much so. So, in other words, the cerebellum is really involved in evaluating all kinds of behavior, Emotional, motorial, cognitive. I say it, it, it's a made of all work. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's look at some of the, um, uh, the the sensory activities. If we can look at the at the, the hemisphere on the other side, w where uh, do we do we see? Do we have auditory sense? Uh, how does language work? Uh, motion. Right. right. That's again one of the <clears throat> remarkable things about <clears throat> brain is that it operates on a principle that we now call localization of function. And this is not a new idea. Back in the, at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, there were ideas that parts of the hemisphere were very much involved in certain kinds of function. Love making, <laughs> money making, <laughs> anger, and so forth. And the idea was that an area, let's say somebody was a great money maker. That part of the brain, which whatever they had decided, let's say it was here, would be swollen and would project through <laughs> right. the skull. And if you palpate the skull, right. you could make the diagnosis. Phrenology. Of, phrenology. <laughs> you could make the, the diagnosis of the personality. That, of course, was ridiculous. However, the idea was not. And we now know today from uh, three generations of good, hard cortical study that you have localization of function of a number of sensory modalities. For instance, there is a strip here that receives and only receives sensory input from the body and also from the face. There is an area on the upper surface of this part of the cortex. We call this the temporal lobe. And we have an auditory receptive area here. In back, at the posterior pole and spreading onto the inner or medial surface, we have the primary visual receptive area for vision, for seeing, surrounded by a number of what we call association areas where the visual experience is developed, enlarged, and in a sense associated with other components. So this, in a sense, this localization of function is an important organizational constituent mm. of cortex. Mm. But separating these specific areas, vision, audition, sensation, smell, olfaction here, separating them is an enormous, I don't want to say wasteland now, <laughs> an enormous terra incognita, an unknown uh, land of association area. And here is where our higher 
concepts and where our memories are stored. So if I ask you to remember the smell of um, a carnation, you're not old enough, Robert, but I am. For me, carnation always meant the carnation in the ear of the girl I was dancing with, the heavy odor, the beauty of the senior prom or whatever, that's all still in here. And it's a conglomerate of the visual, strongly auditory, very strongly olfactory, all brought together. Now, this whole mass here in front of the yeah. sensory and motor sections, right. which are very specific for specific parts of the body, this area is, is, is perhaps one of the most unknown Absolutely. areas, and it's the largest. The probably 30% of the brain is what we call prefrontal. That is, it's the front part of the frontal lobe that goes back yay far. The prefrontal cortex, we say, is the executive. That, in a sense, uh, you might say, damns it with uh, too little detail. Because this is, we think, the most recently evolved and the highest level of functional cortex. Here, we maintain our focus. Here we project into the future. With the help of this, we know that our lives will be terminated. It is this area that allows us to go to school for four years and go to graduate school for another four and then intern or whatever with a view in mind eventually. In other words, we maintain focus. We guide ourselves according to reality. This is also the area that allows us to adapt to the constraints of social living. And by the way, this area right here also is able to maintain a trace, a brief memory, for a sufficient period of time for us to wrestle. We do mental arithmetic because this allows us to remember the... the very, and by the way, something else that's developed in the last 10 or 12 years, you may have heard the term mirror neuron. They were first discovered actually in a monkey in this general area. We now know that the human, of course, has them, and they are located in several other areas. The beauty of this new conceptual entity, the mirror neuron, is that it is a combination of motorial and sensorial reactivity. What does that mean? It was first found when some investigators who had a monkey they were working with, the monkey was sitting in a chair, one of the investigators went out and got an ice cream cone and began to lick the ice cream cone. The monkey, as it watched the licking, would show great explosions of neuronal activity in this area. He was living the experience, even though he wasn't doing well, it himself. Vicarious. Vicariously. Today, we think of this as the center of empathy and possibly also the secret behind which, the secret which allows us to learn our language. Mm. We imitate, we empathically mm reproduce parts of the external world inside, and thereby, we, we thereby become parts of that external world. Remarkable. And all of this you can hold in your hand. Yes.